I want to thank Ross and Patrick, uh, and I'm honored to be here. I mostly work on writing poetry and translating it and uh, studying it. So Auden said, poetry makes nothing happen. So everything I say today is not going to have any practical use or value. <laughs> um, before I just read um, from uh, parts of this study on this important poet, and I hope you will see why he's important, I just want to say that I'm generally interested in two things. The poetry of mourning, and that might seem like a luxury, but mourning is very crucial and very consequential politically in every country because the way we mourn the past will have consequences as to how we imagine and think of the future and the present. And this is very true in this country, the recent events. But mostly I'm interested in the way Iraqis um, mourn and think of the past. The other thing is the narrative through which the history of Iraq and the history of the war is seen, not only in this country but in Iraq, because it's very obscure and very problematic, which brings me to the other issue, which is the epistemic and the discursive violence that Iraq has to and Iraqis have to suffer from. Because I'm older and I'm a very melanc melancholic person, so I will focus on, I'm, I'm pessimistic. I don't have anything about the future. Everything is about the past. But I just wanted to say something which sadly I've been saying for 20 years in that, um, in general, of course, you know, history is somehow also about amnesia and it's always selective. But I think in this country, we suffer more so than other places whether when it comes to this country's history, but also its involvements and wars. And when it comes to Iraq, choosing the beginning point, point of understanding something will have its own consequences. And unless one understands and remembers what happened in Iraq in 1991, one will never understand what's happening now. So rather than beginning in March 2003, that, to my mind, was Act Three of something that started in 1991. And when the United States, quote, bombed Iraq back to the pre-industrial age, as James Baker said. And after that, Act Two was having the most genocidal sanctions in the 20th century, which killed at least one million people and drove three million Iraqis, mostly from the middle class abroad, and really strangled the, the country. The other important thing is in 2003, I think, it's important to try to understand what it means to dismantle a state. Because much of what's happening in Iraq now has to do with how the United States took apart a state and institutions that were 100 years in the making and did not replace them with anything. So to echo what was said, the post uh, is a privilege that Iraqis do not have because it's still ongoing. And rather than thinking of it in a linear manner, it's probably concentric. They are still living the consequences of that war. And whether ISIS, whether the destruction, the destruction of public space, the destruction of all of these institutions, all of these are frankly the consequences. Of course, I am not one to belittle uh, the effects of dictatorships and Saddam Hussein, all of that, but we must come to terms with what this country's army and its politicians visited upon Iraqis in 1991 and 2003. With the epistemic violence, really, and this is what interests me the most in how Iraqis, whether average citizens but also makers of culture, then have to confront this, the horror of the past and horror of the present. How to write about this. And there might be some lessons for some American poets and veterans because the, the poet that I'm interested in that I'll talk about who is an Iraqi American <coughs> seems to be able to avoid these ideological traps of writing about one's country and one's country's wars. And, and somehow he avoids the problematic nationalism. I've been interested recently in, in translating and studying his work uh, because he is one of the few who managed to write about the war um, and avoid all of these ideological traps. And in, in talking about him also, it allows us to revisit some of these important issues of violence and history. So uh, much of the discourse on Iraqi violence has tended by and large to reduce it and essentialize it by generally attributing it to two narratives. The first being the perceived resilience of trans-historical ethno-sectarian conflicts and identities, primarily Sunni versus Shiite, 
which are taken to be side effects of an inherently violent, trans-historical and monolithic Islam. The second is the quote, Iraq as a failed state model, which presents Iraq as a particularly weak and doomed state cobbled up by the British colonialism in 1917. And we all, always hear it's an artificial state, as if other states in the world are real or that they grow on trees. And frankly, in this country where you know that much of the country was purchased, so, but the artificiality is deployed when speaking of, of Iraq. And this discourse gained currency after 1991. No one questioned um, whether the country was viable or not before that. Why is that problematic? Because the discourse deployed to counter these two by Iraqi and Arab intellectuals and writers then revert to a hyper-nationalist discourse of an imagined trans-historical Iraq at the heart of which is the Golden Abbasid Age, which of course entails performing multiple illusions when they confront its own violent and complex history, especially that of the modern nation state. Sargon Bolas, who was born in Iraq in 1944, but came to this country in 1969 and lived in San Francisco, stands out as one of a handful of Iraqi writers who managed to resist these all too common ideological traps. Um, and in the way and the strategies he adopts and the way he comes to history of violence, but without filtering it through nationalist or neo-orientalist prisms. Um, all right. I'm going to have to skip because I'm already out of time. Um, well, I guess the way, in a way, he, because the occupation, as I kind of said, leads some, including many Iraqis or others, even not actually Americans, who are against the occupation to assume a less or at times an uncritical view of Iraq's recent past and therefore to underestimate and belittle the violence and destruction brought about by dictatorship and the militarization of society. All, of course, for the sake of highlighting uh, the crimes of the war. Another related but equally important challenge is how to position and affiliate oneself and one's narrative in regards to the competing ideological narratives about Iraq's history and its viability. So these, of course, range from the denial of any sense of imagined Iraq or Iraqiness that existed before the arrival of the British to the very antithesis of an increasingly that increasingly internalized and adopt, adopted by many Iraqis, and by that I mean an Iraqi nationalism which, deploying the land's rich history and civilizational past, projects its existence back millennia. Between these two poles of Iraq as a purely colonized construction and Iraq as a trans-historical entity, we have a variety of ethno-sectarian ideologies. And this is where Sargon also is important because he happens to be from an Assyrian background Yet he resists looking at Iraq through some Assyrian nationalism or some Arab nationalism. And I don't have time, but I think it's important to, to be very critical of much of the writing about the war, especially by vets who don't happen to confront American nationalism and what that entails and how it structurally predetermines and reproduces these wars. Um, the other important point, and some of our friends ask us, why do writers, Iraqi writers, have all these ghosts in your novels and in your poems? <laughs> well, I mean, when two million people die, and you know, whether they are your friends or your relatives or not, I mean, you're gonna be haunted by, by these ghosts. And again, not to sound like an academic luxury, but uh, again, uh, the way one deals with this figure of the ghost is also important politically. Um, because the question of the relationship of the living to the dead, and you know this has echoes to the history of this country when it comes to race. The question of the relationship of the living to the dead is a political one, and itself always a contentious site. Um, it is not hyperbolic to say that Iraq itself is an open mass grave. There are those millions or so victims of the genocidal embargo who are in a figurative mass grave un insufficiently recognized. And the occupation and the civil war that followed, these produced their own variations of horror in terms of violence and displacements. So I borrow this term in this study of the ontology from Derrida about what it means and what the consequences are of the way that we deal with these ghosts. What makes the way that 
Bolus deals with the ghost consequential and different is that one can read these poems as a model for an ethics of mourning and remembering. Memory is not mobilized for a concrete political objective or cynical end. There is no demand for vengeance or retribution, which is the way a lot of these political parties in Iraq now uh, deploy the ghost figure. What takes place in a lot of these poems, which if we had time I would read one of them for you, what takes place is an encounter with the ghost of the past whose only demand is to be recognized and listened to and not to have their narrative or absence forgotten or appropriated. They do not demand to be spoken for, but spoken to. Unlike their status in the dominant political discourse in Iraq, they are not a political commodity, not speaking for the ghosts, but preserving their narratives and monumentalizing them, but without constructing an edifice seems to be a desire running through Bolus's poems. History is confronted with all of its unsavory details, and while the invasion and destruction of the nation's real and figurative walls is chronicled and mourned, there is always a recognition of the violence and bloodshed involved in building these very walls of the nation and all of its political frame, which is what is missing in a lot of the writings of the American veterans, is that somehow the Iraq war is some exception and it's never seen in a very long history of wars. The question and challenge is how to and is it at all possible to sketch a new portrait and frame all of these contradictions. Intimately linked to this is to learn to live with the dead and with the past rather than deny it and to speak to not for its ghosts instead of attempting to exorcise or exploit them. If we have time, I will read a short poem. All right, so the poem is called I Come to You From There and his poems also address what the consequences of the sanctions were and this figure of the Iraqi refugee. The end of the year, the year of endings, the climate and the crows, a tightness in my breathing from smoking too much, some illness, loneliness, worrying or visceral pain, knocked me down and I roamed the empty town and crossed over to that particular corner where he met me face to face, just before nightfall. It was my friend, the short story writer himself, but something had emptied his eyes of that light. It was my humorous old friend himself, but something had overturned his features from the inside. The eyebrows are white, teeth black. When he smiles, not out of happiness, he looks like he is crying, beyond sadness, as if in an undeveloped photograph as if in a burning photograph which would collapse with a simple puff. He met me as we were getting out of a storm that had started yesterday, whipping walls with restaurant and shop signs, making telephone cables weep in that empty square. I cried, Yusuf, Yusuf, what happened to your face? Yusuf, what have they done to your eyes? By God, what have they done to your eyes? He said, please don't ask, it's obliteration. He said, I come from there. He said, not me, no, I am not myself, not you. No, you are not yourself. They and the gods of Zakum, they and the master of death standing at the door. The refugees are on the roads. The children are in coffins. The women are wailing in the squares. Your family is fine. They send you their best from cemeteries. Baghdad is a spike of grain covered with locusts. I come to you from there, he said, and walked away and disappeared everywhere. Thank you.